Hello, and welcome to another Cornerstone Conversation brought to you by the American Cornerstone Institute. Uh, today we have as our special guest, Representative Chip Roy. He is currently the representative of the 21st District of Texas, a former federal prosecutor. He previously served as Chief of Staff to Senator Ted Cruz, Staff Director of Senator John Cornyn's Leadership Office, and Senior Counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. In Texas, Representative Roy was the first Assistant Attorney General under Ken Paxton and served as a Senior Advisor to then-Governor Rick Perry. He served on the Judiciary and Veterans Affairs Committees. In addition to his time in government, Representative Roy has extensive private sector experience, including working as an investment banking analyst for Nations Bank Capital Markets, a technology consultant, and as a counsel in the oil and gas industry. The Congressman also served as the Vice President of Strategy for the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Dr. Ben Carson is the world-renowned neurosurgeon, author, Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient, 17th Secretary of HUD, and the founder and chairman of the American Cornerstone Institute. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. And uh, we're gonna start off by talking about, about immigration and Dr. Carson, why don't you kick us off? First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Roy. I had a chance to uh, travel around with him in Texas. He's absolutely spectacular. Uh, gentleman with a great depth of knowledge, and particularly about the subject that we're going to be discussing today, uh, immigration policy, but uh, lots of policies in general. And you know, we need representatives who really represent the people. And uh, so we're delighted to have you, uh, Congressman. You know, we are a nation of immigrants. Uh, you know, we've all come from some place or another, and that's a good thing because uh, every group uh, you know, brings something that they add to the table. It's sort of like uh, the uh, fable about the soup. Uh, the village was starving and a man came in, he said, I have a magic rock, which will make uh, soup for everyone. Uh, but you, you bring the salary, you bring the carrots, you bring, by, by the time everybody got through bringing stuff, you had stew for everybody. Well, you know, that's, that's the way America is. And it's one of the reasons I think that, that we have risen so quickly, but it has to be done in an orderly fashion. That's the real key. You can't just uh, sort of open the floodgates. And some people say, well, that's not very compassionate. We should just open the floodgates and let everybody come in who wants to come in and we should be glad that they wanna come here. Uh, but those same people probably lock their doors at night when they go to bed. Uh, they probably don't let everybody come into their house and uh, sleep there and eat their food and, uh, and utilize their furniture and, and visit with their families. Uh, that doesn't mean that those aren't things that can't be done. Uh, at some point, once you get to know them. Uh, but that's the way civilization works and including civilization for nations. And uh, so we have to be uh, somewhat reasonable. Uh, we can still be compassionate and everybody who comes into our country doesn't necessarily have to become a citizen of our country. You know, there are several places that have very well established uh, guest worker programs. Canada, for instance, uh, people come and go uh, as they please. Uh, they're registered, they pay taxes. And uh, when that is done in an appropriate way, uh, it works. And uh, you know, we certainly could uh, be thinking more along those lines. Uh, However, if the person wants to become a citizen, they would have to go through the same thing that everybody else has to go through to become a citizen. And certainly it is not fair for people to go through the legal process uh, for years and years, spending thousands of dollars uh, just to have somebody who comes in illegally jump the line to become a citizen ahead of them. Uh, it's very difficult to justify that. I'd like to see somebody try to justify it. Yeah, Representative Roy, you, uh, your state is on the front lines in terms of the jumping the line and, and illegal immigration. Can you talk a little bit about how the lack of border security impacts border states like Texas? Yeah, I'd be delighted to. And, and uh, let me echo 
uh, what Secretary Carson just stated about um, the importance of immigrants and immigration to this great country. You don't really even have to say it, right? And I feel like sometimes uh, people throw it out there as a, um, you know, oh, you know, uh, a precursor to them talking about border security. Um, but it's actually, and what Secretary Carson just said, it's who we are. So, I mean, that's just the reality. And we know that, and it makes us great. Um, and it has from our founding. And, and the Secretary rightfully pointed out, but, but security matters. Sovereignty matters. Um, having an orderly process matters. You know, when people uh, forget that through all of this, and we'll talk a little bit about the illegal immigration and some of the issues that the flood has had an impact on Texas, but they forget that we, we are currently welcoming somewhere between a million and a million and a half people every year through the legal channels, which is a very robust number, uh, the, the greater than the vast majority of the world combined. And we do that and we do it with open arms and uh, we have processes for it. <clears throat> but it's important to have a process for it. It's important to have people come here, go through a process, embrace American values, become American, um, not just walk in the doors and just sort of set up shop in vast numbers. And that risks our security, but it's also bad for the immigrants and bad for our country. Now, how is this unfolding right now in Texas? Well, the, the illegal immigration, the flood that we have currently at the border is uh, far worse than you even realize, whoever's listening to this. I assure you that whatever you're seeing on the news, whatever you've heard about it, if you're living it as we do in Texas, if you're talking to the people at the border and you're looking at the numbers every day like I do, it is just far worse than anybody really realizes throughout the country. Uh, we intercepted 212,000 individuals in July. Now I use the word intercepted because apprehended doesn't do it justice. These are people who are largely coming to our border, to the Rio Grande, coming across, fueled by cartels who make money doing so. And then they seek out and they find a sign that says asylum, asilo in Spanish, that points them in the direction to go to a processing facility where Border Patrol is now, by the way, under this administration, they have an entire unit now stood up to do just processing uh, of, of, of human beings, individuals that are coming to our river, uh, coming to the Rio Grande at our border. And all of this is causing a massive surge that is causing Border Patrol to be unable to actually patrol the border. So what you have now is a million plus individuals. These are, these are record numbers. That 212,000 second highest month total that we have on record and that's in July. We never have those numbers in July because it's hot. But right now, August is looking just as bad or worse. And we've been running those numbers all year because these policies that are currently being uh, uh, implemented by the administration is allowing that to be wide open. The direct impact on our state and on our nation cannot be overstated in terms of empowering cartels, the massive flood of uh, human beings that are then put into the sex trafficking and human trafficking trade. And it's a horrific uh, reality of little girls, predominantly little girls, little boys too, they get put into this, this horrors of essentially modern day slavery in the United States throughout our country. And we have lots of individuals that we know have direct knowledge of this. It happens in Texas and it happens throughout our country. We have a massive amount of fentanyl pouring into our country, made heavily in China, processed and shipped through, through Mexico. And we had 9,500 pounds of fentanyl that have been intercepted this year. To put that in perspective, that is enough fentanyl to kill every man, woman, and child in America multiple times over. And it is coming into our communities and our schools. And finally, there's the dangerous and criminal elements. The number of people that are coming across our border now that we're apprehending, but we're not apprehending them all, that are criminals, that are murderers, that are people who um, have long criminal histories uh, that are now coming back and coming into our country. I could go, go on and on, but it's having a direct impact on sheriffs, communities, schools, hospitals, but also, and I'm going to make a really important point here, the immigrants themselves who are abused in human and sex trafficking, who are then essentially property of cartels, uh, that's what we're allowing to occur in the United States of America in 2021. I'm glad you uh, mentioned the cartels and the uh, human trafficking that's going on, there's going to be a premiere uh, movie uh, called The Sound of Freedom uh, in February. We're actually doing a showing of it in Washington, D.C. Uh, in September. 
And uh, just looking at the massive amount of sex trafficking that's going on right under our noses, the consumer of this, the greatest consumer is the United States of America. Uh, and so we have to make people aware of that. There is actually more slavery in America today than there was in 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation was put forth. Sexual slavery. And, uh, you know, we're all outraged about, you know, slavery as it occurred back in those days. But this is every bit as horrible, the lives that these people go through. And uh, we have got to become concerned about that. You know, as far as the drugs and the crime is concerned, uh, do recognize, I hope everybody recognizes that one of the primary roles of the federal government is to keep its citizens safe, not to facilitate their demise, uh, you know, not to open the, the borders to criminal elements and uh, allow this trafficking of, of drugs, which is killing our citizens. And I think a great deal more emphasis uh, is going to have to be put on that and pressure put on our government and people. One of the reasons that we have the more perfect union aspect of American Cornerstone is so that people have an opportunity to look at and study some of our founding documents, uh, things that talk about the function and the role of our government so that they can clearly see whether the government is in fact fulfilling uh, its responsibilities to the citizens of this country. Well, if I might, add, Eric, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit trail, but I, if I might just add on to what the secretary just said, one other important respect, we're talking about human beings. And I, and I look forward to uh, seeing um, that film in September, and I hope maybe we can do a screening in Texas. Great time, but, you know, the, the human toll cannot be overstated, both for immigrants and those who are put into the sex trafficking trade, but also Americans uh, who are directly impacted by fentanyl and by criminal elements uh, in our uh, cartels that are directly tied to gangs. And uh, what's happening in our, uh, particularly in South Texas, our border region impact on community and property. Um, but when I go to the Rio Grande, when I go down to see what's going on at our border, and I do it frequently, I'm gonna return next week. I'm gonna be down in South Texas with my former boss, Senator Ted Cruz, my friend, and uh, meet with a lot of experts, uh, a lot of human trafficking experts. And our goal is going to be to make clear to the American people the direct impact on our communities and the people throughout our country and, and on immigrants, right? Because people view this, I think, in this kind of arm's length lens, you know, the lens where they, they see this, oh, you know, I've heard of El Chapo and there's these car there's cartels in there in Mexico. And yeah, the border's a little, you know, it, it probably ought to be secured and there's some problems. But, you know, I'm just going to go back to my suburban house in Atlanta or Boston or, you know, Tampa or Denver. And the fact is, uh, this is a nationwide problem. Uh, and as the secretary just pointed out, right, we are uh, responsible for it. There was a car stopped in Bernie, Texas, which is a suburb of San Antonio that had nine immigrants in it. Two were bound and in, in, in the trunk. Uh, one, that was a young man who had paid $4,000 to go pick grapes in California to the cartels. But the cartels were lying to them, all of them, that young man and these young women. And uh, they were then en route to a stash house in Houston, Texas, where they were gonna be held for ransom to have to then pay back to the cartel in order to sort of pay their way. And they were gonna, some of them were gonna be put into the sex trafficking trade and the human uh, labor trade, this modern slavery in the United States. Uh, that's real. That happened in a suburban town just outside of San Antonio, a full 150 miles in from the border. The person driving the car was an American citizen employed by the Cartel del Noreste, which operates heavily out of Nuevo Laredo. I could give you lots of examples and I won't go through that, but that's one example where we worked with the district attorney and that's in, in the district I represent. It's very real and it's real for all Americans. So, uh, go on, sorry, Dr. Ferris. Uh, I, I just remember uh, being down at the border uh, in Texas and Arizona and talking to a lot of the American citizens who live along the border. And uh, I don't think I will ever forget some of the stories that they told us. 
and how uncomfortable it is for them. People just walking through their yard, they're afraid to go outside at nighttime. Um, their animals are sometimes uh, hurt or killed. Uh, the holes are cut in the fences, which then allow the cattle to, to migrate. I mean, it's just, it's a nightmare uh, what they have to go through. And they're incredibly courageous. And obviously they need backup. They need real support and they deserve that. They deserve the protection of our government. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of times you'll hear that illegal immigration is really a victimless crime, but based on what you're saying, Representative Roy, and, and the stories you heard, Dr. Carson, it, it really isn't. So that brings up the next question, which is um, we have, as you both noted, kind of an immigrant history in this country. It, it is who we are. We, we have a, a robust legal immigration system, but at the same time, we have to deal with this illegal immigration system, uh, illegal immigration problems. So I'll, I'll open up the floor to both of you. Uh, Representative Roy, maybe you can start on some policy areas you're working on with people in Congress to kind of address issues with either or both of those uh, concerns, both legal and illegal immigration. And if there's nothing working its way through Congress right now, some ideas you might have that you'd want your uh, fellow representatives to, to work on if possible. Yeah, sure, happy to address that. And then obviously uh, the secretary can chime in. Um, there are a number of policy proposals that I think would make a difference immediately uh, that we should be considering right now. Uh, unfortunately, I'll be a little bit political here. Um, unfortunately, the current administration is not all that interested in trying to take the steps necessary to secure the border. Uh, right now, in this environment, you could do two things immediately to stem the tide, stem the flow, you know, uh, meaningfully secure the border from at least the, the, ch the charge of people we're currently getting which would be good for us and good for them and would diminish the power of cartels. You could uh, reinstate our full application of Title 42, which is under the HHS and our health codes uh, during a pandemic. And it doesn't even have to be during a pandemic like this. It's just in general, our ability to stop people at the border out of concern for the spread of communicable diseases or other health consequences. We have the full power to use Title 42 to do that. Uh, we were doing that under the Trump administration over the last eight months. We have stopped doing that for the most part, particularly for family units. Uh, but frankly, it's been you know, generally a uh, reduction in the application of Title 42. We have legislation to fix that and to demand that we actually apply Title 42. My friend Yvette Harrell from New Mexico has that bill. And I introduced a discharge petition to discharge that off the floor of the House in order to force the speaker to bring it to a vote. We have 149 signatures on that and growing, and we need to get that to 218. Um, a second thing you can do is return to the migrant protection protocols and return to Mexico. A federal judge in Amarillo, Texas, uh, uh, Judge Kazmarek, I know this because he was a law school classmate of mine, uh, he uh, just uh, had a ruling uh, saying that the administration in uh, stopping the use of migrant protection protocols in their in their uh, executive action they took, failed to follow the um, Administrative Procedures Act and do the things that are necessary, and so therefore it is unlawful. So that's being I think I think and I think the Fifth Circuit just currently at least as a first step upheld that. Uh, I need to confirm that. But uh, right now, if we can return to the use of migrant protection protocol, which means you're using a safe third country, and Mexico is generally a safe third country, when people come, that they're then held in Mexico. If they've got an asylum claim, they got to go to the consulate and go and go file an asylum claim if they're, you know, saying that they need to flee uh, persecution. But you can't just come to the United States when you can go to a safe third country. If we enforce our asylum laws and do return to Mexico and use Title 42, you largely end the current crisis. Then what you need to do is permanently fix our asylum laws, permanently fix catch and release, change the system so that people know what it is, they know how to use it, streamline the ability to follow legal uh, proceedings to come to the United States, but enforce our laws. And, and I'll just say this, a lot of people believe and they've tried to say that this is about white Americans wanting to keep brown people out of the United States. That is a lie. That is wrong. Uh, Secretary Carson just talked about people that he met with along the border. I'm sure his experience, like mine, always and consistently, is that people of all walks of life, many Hispanics, many Mexican uh, heritage Americans along the border, Tex-Mex, Texas, Mexico, we've got a long history. 
And so we've got a lot of people in Texas that have family in Mexico. The people that I talk to along the border of Mexican heritage are the first and the most aggressive in wanting to have a strong, secure border so that the cartels don't have control, so that the criminal elements are rooted out, so that immigrants aren't abused, and so that their ranches and property are safer. This is not hard. This is what a sovereign nation does, and this is what we ought to do. And we, we need to be a, a little more logical, you know, when it comes to the medical aspects. Of yes, sir. I mean, we have this new Delta uh, variant. We know that, you know, close to 20% of people coming across that border are infected. And uh, they're being released into our communities. Now, in many cases, they say, well, they're tested first. Well, here's the problem with that. If you take a bunch of people and you jam them all together, um, a lot of them are going to catch it. But when you test them, it hasn't incubated to the extent that you're going to get a positive test. But sometime during the next week or two, you would have a positive test when they're out there disseminating the disease to everybody else. And I guarantee you they know that but they don't seem to really care a whole lot. And a lot of those immigrants are going to Texas and to Florida uh, where they are infecting other people. And of course, uh, there are allegations being made that because Texas and Florida are open states, that's why they have so much disease. Uh, I think also they have a lot of disease because a lot of diseased people are going there. And uh, you know, we need to be sensible and you know, using people as political tools and using their health and putting people's lives at risk to prove a political point uh, shows you the decline to which we have undergone in this nation. And uh, obviously we're gonna have to really start paying close attention to it. You know, when it comes to, to, to compassion, you know, when I look at the people you know, I recognize that this is the place that they want to be. You know, people say that we have a systemically racist country. If it was systemically racist, why would people be forming caravans trying to get in here? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, I understand why they would want to be here. And we have a mechanism. And as Representative Roy said, we take in more than a million people through our legal system every year and we'll continue to try to work with people. But I think we should also ask us, ask the question, why are these people trying to get here? What's going on in their country? And I think there are things that could be done in their countries. I remember uh, some years ago in Cameroon, uh, in Africa, uh, you know, a lot of people were trying to get out of there. Uh, there was just a horrible economy. Uh, there were no jobs. And uh, our government uh, established a program whereby our big farmers could go over there because they have very fertile land and help them create these gigantic farms which produce just all kinds of uh, products which our farmers were able to benefit from economically but more importantly, which provided jobs and really stimulated their economy. And now, you know, people are very happy to stay there. So, I mean, I think there are lessons to be learned there too. The amount of money that we spend, uh, you know, defending uh, against illegal immigration, if a portion of that were used for economic development and we had the right kinds of relationships with those governments, I think we could improve things on this side of the world. Well, Dr. Carson, if I might just add on to that just real quick and just to say, I, I agree completely. Um, and uh, frankly, securing the border isn't actually all that expensive of an exercise as much as it is willpower. So if we just did what we're supposed to do and secured the border and then devoted time and energy and resources to building out a strong Western hemisphere econ economy, let's build relationships, let's go way beyond USMCA, right? Let's, let's explode the doors off of USMCA and, and really dive into what we could do if you had a robust, strong environment in Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador and Central America. Uh, let's imagine the pressure we could put back on China if we were able to have robust growth and economic growth throughout the Western Hemisphere. 
Uh, and what that would mean for our own uh, well-being at the border. So you reduce the pressure valve. And frankly, why don't we increase a little reverse pressure valve, right? I mean, I, I want every American who wants to stay in America to stay here. But, you know, if you can go and develop and produce and, and know that you're going to get your wealth and have pros prosperity and create economic growth and have people go in and coming to Mexico and to Central America, that's a good thing. And right now, because of the rule of law, the lack of the rule of law, and because of, frankly, lack of economic growth and prosperity, you don't have what you could have there. So we ought to do that. It's in our national security interest to work with them to do that. And so uh, I couldn't agree uh, more that uh, that's that's an important thing for us to focus on. And just a, a little cautionary tale for those people who are trying to violate our immigration policies and, and bring all of these people in for political reasons because they hope to have voters. Uh, we were having some work done at our place by a bunch of Honduran workers. And they said, we love your administration. This was back during the previous administration. Right. We love what you're doing, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> you know, it's funny. There's a lot of that. There's yeah. a lot of that. And, and people who, who uh, I mean, here as, as a Texan, right? The ongoing joke is all these people who come to Texas, uh, that were less concerned, frankly, about the ones coming from the South, uh, wanting to seek freedom, whatever. It's the ones coming from, you know, California, California. some <laughs> other places, you know. But uh, but even they, frankly, if I'm being honest, people who choose to move to Texas are often doing it because they want to seek freedom, and whether they're coming from Honduras or California. Absolutely. No California, my Texas, right? That's what this <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, Representative Roy, you said a couple minutes ago that one of the longer term issues is fixing the asylum system permanently. Would yeah. you mind kind of going in depth a little bit on that in terms of what the current system looks like, what you identify the problems are, and maybe what some of those permanent fixes might be? Yeah, well, uh, right now, uh, just to recap, asylum is being abused. Um, and, and as I said, if you I could pull up, I could pull up pictures on my phone. Uh, when people come across the border, literally, if you go down right now to McAllen, you go down by the river, there are little signs written. They're written on the back of Department of Homeland Security stationery. They say a silo with, with essentially a Sharpie with an arrow. And then there's a path and they send people over to where they get in line uh, to go get processed. Well, the truth is well over 90 percent of those individuals. It's hard to know the exact numbers, right, because, you know, they're fluid every day. But the history tells us well over 90% of those individuals have no actual claim for asylum under our laws. That when Congress passed the laws properly, I think generally, uh, wrote them to say that if you are uh, claiming asylum, you're doing so from political or religious persecution. And um, you're not able to claim asylum just for economic hardship. Yes, lots of people want to come here for opportunity. But that would be a very large number of the world, right? And so what we have to do is try to differentiate there and then have different rules in place. So right now, we're not enforcing those laws and we're not processing people uh, the proper way. So there are a number of things you could do to uh, fix that problem. Uh, one of which is to just have more manpower just simply enforcing the laws. And when you're processing people, do it to process them very quickly. You know, when they come in and say, OK, well, all right, you don't qualify under our laws. Um, and so you're going to face removal. Once you do that a few times, then people stop coming that, that, that don't qualify. Then that's ultimately what, what you want to do, because the problem with the current system is that all of those people that are coming are paying five, six, seven thousand dollars uh, ahead to the cartel. They're getting money from either American sources or they're selling their stuff and doing whatever they can to get money. And they pay the cartels for the trip and the, basically the ticket to get into the United States. And then often they're then held for ransom or maybe they pay a lesser amount. Then they're put into the labor trade or the sex trade in order to pay off their debt to the cartel. This is real, right? I mean, we gloss over it. I mean, the secretary didn't gloss over it and we're not here. But I mean, in people as a society, we gloss over that because, again, it seems foreign. But it's right there at our border. The cartels have operational control of the border from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Big Bend, for sure, in Texas and frankly beyond. And so every human being that crosses it, the cartels know it and they're involved with it. And they're somehow and there's a dollar changing hand. So our asylum laws can be changed by 
uh, having more enforcement, more judges to be able to process the claims. If you did what I explained before with Title 42 and return to Mexico, and you did all of that, you'd stem the tide. The permanent solutions to asylum would be to just tweak the laws of asylum to require, for example, you to file for asylum in the country in which you reside, rather than being able to race to the border to claim asylum, absent some exigent circumstances, right? We're always going to take somebody who's fleeing, right? A baby on your doorstep. But but you, you could change the laws to tweak that to make sure that asylum is not being abused. And then if you fix the catch and release Flores decision and you fix the TVPRA decision and some of those things that, that restrict our ability to enforce the law, uh, if you fix those, then you again, you send a signal. This is all about signals, okay? There are very few people who are getting up to our border who are the ones who are truly fleeing religious and political persecution. It is a vast exodus of people seeking economic opportunity. And frankly, you have to be blunt, in a society with massive social welfare, there are people that are taking advantage of the social welfare net here in the United States and education and healthcare. So all of that combined, when you've got a massive Medicaid expansion under Obamacare and all of that with open borders and the pressure and then economic opportunity, you get what we're getting. And oh, by the way, last point, I'm sorry I went too long here. Um, the first lady of, I think it was either Guatemala or Honduras, I always forget which one, was here in the United States about a year ago uh, when President Trump was still in power and was talking about the harm on her country by the mass exodus and how good it was that we were trying to hold the line in order that they not drain their country of their best and brightest, of their people. And, and look, they've got a lot of work to do, right? They got to look in the mirror, but we need to help them. And we need to work to try to help their country be strong. Go help them enforce the rule of law. Help them, you know, root out some of these cartels that are undermining the rule of law, and to uh, decrease the pressure of coming here to the United States. Yeah, I think also if if we did something with the chain migration, yeah. uh, it would be helpful, uh, altering the rules in some way, because if someone comes here, automatically you know, you get to pull in a bunch of other people, whether you've been productive or not. And I think it really should have something to do with, have you been productive? Have you added, you know, to our nation and to the economy? Uh, and then, yes, absolutely, you can bring people uh, for whom you will be responsible. But uh, otherwise, you know, we're not doing anything that's very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Representative Roy, you said something that, that struck me a little bit about how the cartel has operational control over, you know, a large area of Texas, which, you know, every American, regardless of what they think about immigration, if there's too much, too little or anything else, should really be concerned by the fact that a, foreign, a group of foreign nationals can exert uh, operational control over anywhere in the United States. That should only be the, the province of, of uh, us and our laws and not what they want to do. Um, so hopefully we can convince the administration to be concerned about that, if nothing else. Yeah, no question. And, um, you know, we could get into some, some, some of the weeds here, but, but what you have happening um, from McAllen all the way up along the border uh, to, you know, Laredo del Rio all the way up and, and then frankly to El Paso, uh, sort of a big gap out near Big Ben. And speaking of Texas, we'll let some others speak to, you know, Arizona and California and New Mexico. But you have, uh, it, it's, it, no one debates this, right, by the way. When you go talk to Border Patrol agents on the border, when you talk to the media who follow this, guys like Brandon Darby with Breitbart does a great job in, you know, knowing the cartel environment. When you talk to experts, guys like Jason Jones, uh, who is out there, a former Texas DPS agent who, uh, knows a lot about the cartels. Uh, no one doubts the extent to which they have uh, full control of the border, uh, uh, particularly on the Mexican side, to, to be clear on that part, but with significant influence mm -hmm. uh, on the Texas side uh, in terms of impacting local law enforcement officials. You know, there was a mayor in a small town down there who was uh, running a drug op in a, on the American side who was drugging, running drug operations through the bar that the mayor owned in this small town, not too far from McAllen, that the cartels were operating through. And that was one of the places they would come coming through the river. Like that stuff occurs a lot along the river because look, the cartels are really powerful and you've got family members across the river. Then they've got pressure points on you. 
They've got political pressure points on you. And so that's the, the way of life along the Rio Grande. And you've got a situation where Tamaulipas, which is the Mexican state that runs from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up along that region up to Laredo, um, that Tamaulipas isn't really run by the politicians. It's not really run by the governor or the elected officials. It's really run by the cartel uh, uh, Jalisco New Generation, a um, little bit cartel de la Reste uh, of Los Zetas, and a little bit Reynosa faction of the Gulf Cartel. The really new generation has been kind of taking over. There's been sort of a, uh, uh, a merger, if you will. And um, the, that new generation cartel is really running it. And they're a little bit more violent than the previous ones. They're bringing some of the central Mexican violence to that area. It was already violent, but it's getting extra violent. You know, we've got people that have been, we know we've got uh, evidence of them being locked into bars, the bar lit on fire, shut the doors, you know, mass grave sites, people hung from bridge from, from bridges, uh, people that uh, have been you know, burned alive or put into vats. I mean, I just go on and on and on uh, the terrible things that happen at the hands of the cartels. You know, one last point, I met with a Mexican official, I won't, won't name his name, uh, but a nice guy along with someone that was heavily involved with the human trafficking world. And they showed me a video and it was a video of the brother of a cartel um, a guy that had gone to jail, but then had gotten out because of corruption in Mexico. And the brother recorded this video. It was like a three minute ish sort of video to uh, a song. And the whole video was about him going around and threatening and beating up women. And the song was basically the lyrics of the song was, you know, essentially, we're going to come get you if you're narking on us and the cartels. Like, that's the way of life. That's what's happening. And that's all extending up in the United States. We just had two burned bodies in Austin. The local Austin PD tell me is starting to be some of the signs of cartel type violence we're seeing pop up in Texas. So it's real and it's a problem. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's scary if it's coming over here. Um, we actually were thinking about having another topic, but we've run so long and rather than uh, giving that short shrift and running up against our window, I think we'll just have to have you on for a, a second round at some point Happy in the future. Uh, so would you like to have a little bit of a concluding statement? Sure. I mean, first of all, just I love um, the organization and what y'all are doing. Uh, uh, Secretary Carson, I, I, I very much want to participate in, in uh, this uh movie that we're talking about, the impact of human trafficking, but just, just the recognition, um, I mean, you know, the, the, the core principles of what y'all are talking about in terms of faith, in terms of liberty, community, life, these are in fact the cornerstones of the American way of life. They are. And if we do not return to those, then we don't really have um, a path forward as a nation in which we can be unified because we have to be able to agree to disagree in our federalist system. We have to be able to get back to community. We gotta be able to focus on the veteran and the neighbor down the street, rather than looking to the VA or some massive federal program, which leaves people behind and bankrupts our country. We need to take care of business at home, our local schools, our local communities, uh, be, be advocates for life, advocates for liberty, uh, and remember that intersection with faith and the importance of civil society to make sure that people are, 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 are uh, cared for. So I applaud what your organization is doing. And, and border security is about combat, compassion. And I think that's what I would close with. It's about compassion uh, because a secure border is better and safer for both Americans and migrants. It, does, it, it reduces the power of cartels. It reduces crime. It reduces harm. And there are plenty of ways for us to be able to help people uh, be lifted up, uh, find legal ways to come to the United States for sure. But let's work uh, to build a better Western Hemisphere and a better world to reduce that pressure valve. But delighted to join you, and God bless you, and, and appreciate the opportunity. Well, Representative Roy, we're so delighted that uh, that you were able to do this, and for the incredible work that you're doing, and the bravery and integrity that you have exhibited. You know, this is such an important topic, and you know, I personally have visited 68 countries and uh, I have lived overseas. So I fully understand why people wanna be here. This is, this is by far the best place in the world to be and my wife and I thank God all the time that we were born in America. Um, having said that, we have a real responsibility to make sure that America remains America, remains a place with liberty and justice for all. 
uh, does not uh, deteriorate and disintegrate uh, for political reasons, for people trying to get short-term political gains completely changing the nature of our country. Uh, everybody is welcome in this country, uh, but they're welcome to become Americans. They're welcome to embrace the American ideals of liberty and freedom, of respect for other people. And uh, if, we, if we do that, uh, I think we will continue to have a great nation, but uh, make no mistake, we are in for a fight. We are fighting right now for the future of America, the American dream and what it represents, not only here, but to the rest of the world. Remember, there's no other nation that has a dream. There's only an American dream. And there's a reason for that. And it's our job to preserve it. Well said, Dr. Carson. Uh, Representative Roy, thank you very much for joining us. And for those of you watching at home, you can go to our website, americancornerstone.org, to learn more about the organization and uh, see this video and uh, other ones that we've recorded in the past. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all.